You've reached Hotel Pacifico, your five-star destination for BC Politicos. Press 4 for room service. Press the star key for your hosts, Mike McDonald and Kate Hammer. Welcome back, guests, to Hotel Pacifico. It's a beautiful day at the hotel here. Actually, I'm realizing for the first time in a few weeks, we've got all your favorite voices and faces at the regular posts. Jeff's up in the strategy suite. Mike's down in the lobby with his white gloves and his pea coat, ready to greet you all. It's good to see you, Mike. Oh, great to be back. Well, I was here last week. You weren't here. That's well, the, but I'm it's confused. not. It's it's it. Well, it was a mixed up constellation. We were doing like different posts and filling in for each other, and now we're all in our we're all in our posts. Well, you, all, yeah. Well, you missed a good one last week uh, with Don Wright, who I listened, from Saskatchewan. I loved it. Uh, I loved it. Uh, a a stubble. What is it? A stub a stubble, a stubble jumper? Was Don Wright yeah. a stubble, stubble jumper. jumper? I don't know that Don Wright was. I think he might have been more of a city Saskatchewaner. Uh, um, but uh, still, but we have a back-to-back -back Saskatchewan uh, content on the Hotel Pacifico. The hotel, are we going to do it? Saska Co? Saska Sask Pacific. Doesn't work. Sask Stop it. it. Doesn't Don't work. do it. Don't yeah, do okay, it. Fine. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, well, so listeners might be noticing that they might hear a familiar voice and might feel like the pod feels a bit cursed today, perhaps. I don't know if they're getting that vibe. Yeah, uh, you might, this voice you're hearing, you might uh, recognize uh, from our sister podcast, Curse of Politics. Uh, our guest today is a former director of communications in the Harper PMO, a former vice president at Sun News Network, currently a partner at Rubicon Strategy, and most importantly, a co-host of our sister podcast, Curse of Politics. Welcome to Hotel Pacifico, Corey Tanike. It's my pleasure. It's great to be on. I'm it's one of these uh, long-time listener, big-time fan, sort of first-time appearance situations. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of what you guys have been doing. It's an uh, uh, incredibly good way to catch up on BC politics, which I think is some of the most interesting politics in Canada. We, yes. Yeah. We appreciate you plugging us on the, on the national show. And it's good to have a, a I don't know if this, this is how you describe yourself, but a full-throated conservative uh, coming on our show is that can we call you that or a fire well, breathing yeah, conservative yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah i don't know I, I find that's always a moving target uh it does, <laughs> doesn't matter how full-throated you think you are there's always someone who thinks that you're somehow selling out but uh anyway long time conservative why don't we settle with that so Corey, you are uh, a self-professed self-confessed uh avid bc watcher um it's great to be talking to you at this moment in time because i think we're at a moment in time where on the center right, the right, you know, we're seeing a bit of a cleave and, and your own political career kind of goes back to a time of really a coming together of the center right and the right um, uh, before you went into uh, the prime minister's office. Um, can you tell us a little bit from that experience, did you come away with any sense of what a secret sauce might be for uniting the right? Well, I'm not sure if it's necessarily a secret sauce, but like I, I do think there is looking back at at various parties that have gone through this, the way that it happens, and it's more of of one party subsuming another and uh, a dominant player being established, and then just a shared frustration and in, in the parties involved with losing and a desire to to create a coalition that can challenge the incumbents uh, who you're fighting uh, for government in a sustainable way. Um, you know, and, and that's really, if you think back to the experience federally, what happened, like, uh, my start was really more in, in the reform party and the old PC party back in the nineties. And, uh, you know, in fact, my first job in politics was working with, uh, Marjorie LeBreton, who was in the Senate at the time, uh, and the aftermath of the 93 election, when that's really the only place you found, uh, conservatives in Ottawa, other than than the two that were elected, uh, Elsie Wynne and, and uh, Jean Charest. Um, but it, th that fight went on for like over a decade. And uh, you had the Reform Party and the PCs just beating the tar out of each other, you know, with repeated elections of both basically at 20 points and uh, perfectly splitting but, the vote in Ontario and uh, perfectly it, splitting the vote in Ontario. Yeah. Um, with like a regional rump in, in Atlanta, Canada for the PCs, uh, a total wipeout of them in, in Western Canada, which, you know, generally elects half the conservative seats for, for if you were gonna form government. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was a dominant player and a dominant player in terms of fundraising and, and political organization, that was the Reform Party. 
Uh, but it took a long time to get there. Um, if you look at the example of the Saskatchewan party, which is probably more analogous to what's going on in BC, uh, it was the little PC party subsuming the provincial liberal party. And uh, uh, that, it, you know, it wasn't a perfect uh, uh, example of that in that uh, uh, not everybody came, but enough people came that it, that it accomplished the task over time. But, but it wasn't a merger of equals and these things never are. Now, I don't think that holds out a whole lot of hope for something happening in BC yeah. before the next election, yeah. just given the, the nature of, of the personalities involved and the fact that, you know, historically, uh, the BC Liberal Party or BC United would be, uh, you know, viewed as the, the establishment player, the, the larger of the two, and, and their seat count would, you know, indicate that today, obviously. But in terms of polling support, and and momentum i would say it's favoring the conservatives and uh -huh. and so that sort of you know it's too equal right now to to come uh -huh. together and that seems uh -huh. counterintuitive but i think that's actually how it goes uh there has to yeah. be somebody who's you know noticeably stronger for a prolonged period of time before before people come together otherwise it's just too much of a knife fight everyone thinks that they can win yeah they need a lot more than a secret sauce here they need a, a case of red bull um to get these conversations going with an election uh, seven months away, uh, it seems inconceivable that there could be uh, some form of uh, rapprochement between uh, between those parties. And as you noted, it's often a case of one subsuming the other. I suppose uh, you know people can do that with their feet and uh, outside of what the leaders of the parties want. Uh, people can walk with their feet either from the legislature in one direction to the other or or party members, but. I don't sense we're at that stage here yet, or may never get there. Um, and they, I'm, you know, in BC, you know, usually provincial elections are a big deal in terms of the stakes. Uh, the, you know, typically being polarized. You know, an NDP government versus a free enterprise government used to be a much bigger distance between them than maybe it is today. Nevertheless, I don't think people on the free enterprise side of the spectrum are looking to repeat what. The Conservatives went through nationally and had three elections to lose before getting to one where you, I think it was four elections in a row that were lost until you finally got to power 13 years later. So, you know, as you say, it's uh, leaders have to, it depends on the personalities in a large part. Well, and, and, and the personalities in this case aren't conducive to that. Like it really, you know, federally it required new blood. And, mm -hmm. and actually in Saskatchewan it did too. It was, you know, um, uh, it required somebody actually coming from the reform reform party, Owen Hermanson, to actually kind of bring the thing together. Um, as, who wasn't involved in the in the fights in the legislature, etc. But you know, is it likely that that somebody thrown out by the one leader from a party is going to uh, going to come together back with that same individual? I, that seems like a, a, a bridge too far in my mind. Uh, you were critical in your uh, year end show on the curse of politics. I think you gave some sort of award to Kevin Falcone, as you called him. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, no, I just, he's uh, an yeah. alter ego of Kevin Falcon. Well, that, that's how, yeah. Uh, yes. But, that's, uh, yeah. But you were critical because uh, I can't remember the award, but it wasn't necessarily a complimentary uh, one. What, what were your observations I, behind that? Actually, it was complimentary. I gave him the, you know, conservative to watch, the person to watch, I think. Um, and because I do think there is momentum behind what the BC conservatives are doing. You right said now. Rustad was the one to watch. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Rustad. Yeah. Yes, of course. Sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I don't think I gave an, a, a, uh, an award to, to him, but, uh, but no, Rustad's the one to watch. Like the, look, uh, it, it, it's going to be, you know, I think very interesting to see how this plays out. And we're going to probably talk about this a lot more, but, you know, there are a couple of other things going on outside BC that I think are really going to uh, animate the fight and, uh, and the difference for voters. One is, uh, the polling numbers that, that Polyev has and uh, and the surge that you're seeing uh, with the Conservatives federally. Uh, I think there's there's maybe on the BC United side a little too much currency being placed in ballot confusion and not mm -hmm. enough being placed on the issues underlying it. Huh. And and really, if you look at the issues federally that are animating things, and I, and I don't think BC is an exception to this, carbon tax is issue number one. And um, um, I've listened to uh, uh, some of Kevin Falcon's interviews around this, and I have trouble 
discerning a message around it and clarity mm-hmm. around it and the ability to actually use that wedge that Polyev is using so effectively, yeah. uh, whereas Rusted uh, can and does and uh, and can speak with the same sort of clarity that uh, Polyev does around that issue and, uh, to the point that I think it is a very effective political wedge. Ironically, they, I mean, they both voted for it uh, when it was introduced, yeah. but, you know. That was a long time ago, I suppose. <laughs> well, yeah, well, well, like opinions well, change. On things change, things, yeah, right? yeah. Well, I mean, to your point about Rustad, I mean, he's obviously take uh, opportunistically grabbed onto the conservative brand, and there's a lot of uh, heat behind it right now because of what's happening with Polyev and the federal conservatives. The numbers I've seen in public polls lately show Polyev running over forty percent in BC. And that's actually a close to provincial mandate if you applied that to a uh, provincial election. And then you have these two parties that are almost perfectly splitting that 40% or, or thereabouts. Whereas usually the the orthodoxy uh, of the coalition, free enterprise coalition, it was liberals and conservatives together. And the liberals are actually, such as they are right now, federal liberal voters are are two to one going NDP. But there's a case to be made that you could run the table with conservative voters, some of whom are former liberals, uh, and run the table with it and give the NDP a run for the money here. It's just obviously, it's a two-headed beast right now. But don't you think that what's even more interesting, and I think you're seeing this not just in Canadian politics or, or provincial politics, whether it's BC or Ontario or federal politics, conservatives are increasingly eating the lunch of of traditional NDP voters, uh, yeah. sort of yeah. what you would constitute as traditional blue collar voters. Uh-huh. Like uh, here in Ontario, where I'm talking to you from, uh, the, the Ford government got endorsements of nine private sector labor unions uh-huh. uh, in the last election, which is unbelievable because they'd spent you know decades basically at each other's throat, the provincial conservative party and the organized labor movement. Now, I don't think that that's going to change on the public sector side anytime soon, but uh, private sector labor movement has moved to be more conservative, not just in Canada, not just provincially, but like basically across the Western world. Uh-huh. And, and, and that sort of tidal push is, uh, is something that we're seeing everywhere. And I think there are a lot of interesting reasons for it. And some of them harken back to what we just talked about around uh, carbon tax, but sort of a, a disconnect uh, between the traditional progressive social democratic roots of the labor movement have become detached. They become something that's a little more woke, that's a little more urban, that's a little more fringe, and uh, a lot more disconnected from you know the daily life and, and lived experience of, of those voters and those people. So like if you were wear, you know, uh, uh, steel-toed boots and uh, carry your lunch to work and shower at the end of the day, not at the start of the day. Uh, you're, you know, you're driving an F-150 truck. Uh, you know, you wear a poppy on Remembrance Day with pride. Uh, you believe in, you know, standing for the national anthem. Like these are things that are increasingly not a part of that progressive voter universe, and increasingly where conservatives really have sold, you know, sort of sold the playing field almost entirely to themselves. This is one of the most fascinating pieces, I think, about the handoff between John Horgan and David Eby, because John Horgan so much more easily, right? He was stickier for those voters. He embodied so much of that kind of older iteration of the of the NDP. And David Eby, you know, coming from a civil liberties background, downtown, younger, um, you know, just embody something different. And there's a flip of this, though, I want to say, Corey, because I'm going to point to some of the housing policy the EB government has introduced, where he's really pushed in areas that can be uncomfortable for conservatives and where, you know, the the demographics on that are maybe less political stripe and more age, particularly in, in the greater Vancouver area, where it's just impossible. Like, I can tell you from experience, you think Toronto is hard, try moving <laughs> to Vancouver, gosh, but I want to ask, I want to give you a second, maybe like, are there things you've watched in how the EB government has acted, um, you know, in its first year and a bit that you think have worked well or um, would applaud? Well, I think the leadership transition has gone much better than I would have anticipated it would, because like, I do think everything you just said about 
uh, Oregon and sort of where he lives in the in the political ecosystem uh, versus EB. I think they are coming from two different wings of that party and uh, with two different support bases. Um, but it it like it it appears from afar to be a lot more seamless than I would have thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's benefiting also from a very divided and evenly divided opposition, uh, which gives you a lot of room to play. I don't get the sense that voter satisfaction around cost of living or any of these things is is any better when you look at the you know regional breakouts of national numbers on this. People are as grumpy in British Columbia around those issues as they are in the rest of the country. But support for the government remains higher than you see in some other places. And I think divided opposition is part of that. So maybe, maybe, is that something good or is that good luck? Probably more good luck uh, than, than it is by design. Um, well, by your own estimation, it's very good luck. I think you just told us it's going to take a decade for this to sort out. So Well, it, well, it could. Um, but look, the other thing that I would never underestimate that you know, by BC political standards, being a pretty scandal-free uh, administration. Yeah. And yeah. and I do think that matters. I do think that matters in terms of the intensity of people's uh, desire to, quote, throw the bums out. And, um, I th- you know, but also part and parcel of a fairly clean leadership handoff uh, is it does take down the time for a change number because you've had some change, you've had some pressure released mm. Uh, around that, uh, if you do it well, and that, and when do you see governments sort of live a little bit longer than than their natural life expectancy? It's when you're able to do those kinds of leadership handoffs in a fairly clean manner. So, like uh, you know, that I think you give them credit for the scandal free. I think you give them credit for uh, the divided opposition. I think you thank the lucky stars for that one. Yeah, I just want to check too. You did apply a different standard for political scandal to BC than to credit compared to the rest of the country. I think you did say by BC well, you, standards. You guys, have had, you, you guys have had a lot of them. It's, Amazing. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, but uh, you know, actually, I was uh, uh, listening to your interview uh, with Horrigan around this, and and he made a few observations that I thought were very on point that that the public has very low expectations for politicians, generally speaking, and especially in those areas. And it's, um, you know, it's uh, comparing body counts of different serial killers, as opposed to whether or not you're, you're a good guy or a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my observation, I mean, I agree with you, obviously, in the last year, the leadership transition transitions come pretty smoothly. Um, having been part of a previous leadership transition, which had a bit of a, a rocky year um i can appreciate you know all the hard work that must have gone into that behind the scenes with the ndp now having said that i think we talked about it in the last week or two uh, on this show when you look at job performance on the issues that people care about the most affordability housing healthcare, crime it's it's uh, f f f f uh, for the government. So they're kind of defying the laws of political gravity right now in that the, you know, the premier's approval rating is high. Uh, they've got this 20 plus point lead in the polls, mainly because of a vote split. And, you know, I, I actually think the conditions are there for a very competitive election. If the, uh, a realignment, uh, was possible. Now, one thing that I find kind of interesting when I've heard conversation about the conservatives who are telling, apparently, allegedly, telling some of their candidates and others, well, you know, we're going to run this time, be the opposition, and then next time uh, we're going to uh, contend for government. And I, I find that totally unsatisfactory as a political strategist to say, we're going to just do a mulligan on this one to win the next one. I mean, Oh, I'm interested in your take. I mean, I've always think like, yeah, 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 throw everything at it to win the one yep. right in front of you. Do you agree with that? I 100% agree with that, Mike. Yeah. Like, you got to play to win. Uh, like, yeah. you know, uh, I've always been a fan of uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You know, first prize, new Cadillac, <laughs> Eldorado. Second prize, a set of steak knives. Third prize, yeah. you're fired. Like, that's, that's really, I think, how politics works. And, like the consolation yeah. prize really sucks compared to to the big prize, and nobody is voting to put somebody in the consolation prize position. Your voters are there because they want you to be in government, and you gotta you gotta fight to win. Um, 
I do agree that the conditions are there when you look at those those underlying numbers for a surprise. But the surprise isn't going to be a surprise merger. The surprise is going to be one of the the, the opposition mm -hmm. parties gets a substantial enough mead and yeah. uh, and then the other one completely collapses. Yeah. And you can think of elections where you've seen that. Like, uh, you know, look at um, look at the uh, Ontario example that brought Mike Harris to power, where he yeah. catapulted from third party to to majority government. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the kind of situation where you could see that and. And I think there's potential there to do it. I, I just, you know, I struggle, um, you know, frankly, with both of the opposition parties uh, to see a super clear path. I think there are ways for them to do it, but I'm not sure either one of them is on, on that path today. I would say there's probably more potential in the PC conservatives in some ways. And that's because I think they're closer to a frame that when you look at public opinion polling uh, is definitely working with the BC electorate. And that is, that is the, uh, the message track that Polyev is on, and and only one of the two leaders is closer to that message track, and yeah. it and, and so you know I think um, you know Kevin Falcon is uh, <laughs> is maybe encumbered a bit by uh, being more married to the positions of of the party he was a minister in uh, uh, than the leader of the BC Conservative Party. Rustad seems to be much more comfortable. Uh, you know, uh, marrying himself to Polyev and that message track and and breaking uh, with uh, with history in terms of, of having supported a carbon tax uh, uh, previously. And and, you know, it's OK to change your mind as long as you're changing in the direction that the electorate is going. Well, I would say if uh, and I, again, I'm just uh, having fun with this as an academic conversation here. If there was a Big Bang event where whether it's cooperation on you run here, we run there, or or everyone moved in one direction or the other very quickly, like that that made it very clear who was going to be the contender. I think it would create a lot of momentum at a very interesting time that the government wouldn't have a lot of time to react to. So I wouldn't <laughs> rule out something just because politics abhors a vacuum and, you know, Desperation may may uh, force certain players into I, I, certain activities. I think you're being a bit I, wishful. Yeah, I, I just think it's I think it's really hard to actually make that happen. It's okay. much more conceivable to have the electorate make the decision for you. Uh -huh. And yeah. you know, if if that there's actually going to be a swing, it's probably more likely. But like, let's talk about what the challenges I think for Rustad are. It's it's you got to be more than a one man band. And uh -huh. like you, if you are vying for government, uh, having a team. Uh, looking like you can put put mm. your you know are you going to put uh, put on your shoes before your pants or your pants before your shoes like you've got to look like you've got your act together to some degree and that you've got a team that people are going to trust to put in government and that's that's about having you know quality candidates and being able to uh, you know run a disciplined campaign where you look like you've got your 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 house in order and. And that's often been a bigger challenge for upstart conservative parties, uh, which tend to have more of a maverick nature to them and, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more of a, you know, rage against the machine, uh, fuck you, I won't do what you told me kind of element mm -hmm. to uh, how they administer themselves. You know, those, those instincts are great for creating their formation and often become liabilities in terms of their political success. Uh, there never would have been a United Conservative Party at the federal level if they'd maintained the approach of uh, question period questions will be faxed in by Canadians and the leader will, you know, sit in the back row sometimes in the front row other times and, you know, we're going to decide every issue by consensus after a nine hour caucus meeting, like all, all of that stuff doesn't work well if you want to actually uh, prosecute an election effectively, but uh, but they tend to to come in concert with with upstart uh, populist conservative movements. I think, I mean, is there a danger, though, for Rustad that he'll reach too far? Because I think the problem is right now on the, you know, on the right is it's crowded. And I and I think you're right that Rustad's kind of strategy is to kind of reach for clarity in a really declarative space. But, you know, that's putting him into places like calling for the firing of Bonnie Henry and stuff that's like just kind of like not there's going to be a lot of folks that that's going to give a head scratch to. Is that a hazard for him reaching too far? Yeah, sure. But I think the, 
the Bonnie Henry Henry stuff has a, a you know a bigger problem with it in my view, which is that it's looking back instead of forward. Mm -hmm. And I would never counsel anyone in a campaign uh, to focus more uh, in the rear view mirror than you are out of the front windscreen. Like you, you got to be looking forward and talking about what you're going to do and and draw very clear straight lines between changes you're going to make and things being better for people in a tangible way. So we've seen a number of post pandemic elections now and and those parties that try to relitigate pandemic policy tend to have done poorly and those that have focused on uh, cost of living uh, issues, housing issues, uh, emergency room uh, or, you know sh uh, staffing shortages and closures, those sorts of practical things, those are the parties that have really done well. And, uh, and, and I, I think that's just, you know, uh, good campaign practice 101 to, uh, to be focused more on forward looking things and things with, with a really direct impact on folks rather than, you know, relitigating whether or not uh, the pandemic was handled properly. I, I think everyone who was involved in, you know, in government during the pandemic has got a lot of scars from that and and there was lots of mistakes to go around and it's like a, a terrible nightmare slash fever dream that people had and they would just want to put it behind them well, so, so let's take, switch. Well, yeah let's go ahead, I, I want to go forward i want to take corey's advice um <laughs> it, put it in practice right now and go forward to the next federal election and and i'm wondering yeah, yeah that yeah i'm sure I, I saw that thought bubble in your head mike um thank you <laughs> Uh, co-host long enough and it happens. The, the <laughs> thing, the thing I'm wondering about Corey is like, I'm just thinking of these conditions and what they sort of set up for the poly of conservatives, particularly in BC, because I think there's a very interesting dynamic where I think you, you mentioned it, you know, we're just as pissed off in BC as the rest of the country. And we're clearly not channeling our ire towards Victoria and the, uh, the provincial government. Um, does that create an opportunity for the federal conservatives to make sure that anger gets channeled at uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, you know, to their to their advantage? Well, it largely is. And I think there's like a really clear reason why the of all the cost of, of living issues, the biggest one is interest rates. That's that's really causing. I wouldn't just say anger. I'd say actually anger is maybe a secondary emotion. Anxiety. There are tons of people who are feeling extraordinary amounts of anxiety around renegotiating their mortgage, things like that, and, and trying to figure out how is it that they are going to keep a roof over their family's head and make, uh, and, and make their budget work for them personally. And, and, and that's a federal thing. And, uh, and so the focus has been higher there. I think EB's done some things that are helpful and keeping the focus there, like calling on the governor of the Bank of Canada to uh, take a different approach to fighting inflation. Um, I think he's actually on some pretty solid uh, ground from an economics perspective in terms of that, like no amount of jacking interest rates in Canada is gonna solve supply chain issues in the South China Sea or the Red Sea or, uh, or uh, make the cost of onshoring manufacturing back to North America less than it was in Asia. Those are all inflationary pressures that no amount of jacking interest rates domestically are gonna address. So what's the, what's the outside of Canada baseline inflation? And, uh, you know, and how much do you use uh, central banking policy in your own country to combat inflation and when is it appropriate and at what level? And I think there are a lot of questions being asked by, by uh, uh, you know, free market conservatives such as myself as to what the appropriate uh, approach is. Like, okay, I think- so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you, Craig, because I totally agree. And you're being super wonky. Like, I, I think about this problem often and, and I completely agree with this. Like we've got this lever that's completely about like raising interest rates internally and agnostic to all the things that actually are driving inflation. How, but- how do you channel that in a way that isn't wonky about like the target, you know, what's the mandate of the bank of Canada and everything well, else? Well, you want a good, you know, yeah. track of how to do that? Look yeah. at what Polyev has been saying in the house every day and what he's been campaigning on, because I think it's a pretty clear uh, and effective delivery of that message. Um, the government has messed up the economy and, and you know, inflation doesn't have to be this high. Uh, interest rates don't have to be this high. And uh, the government just wants to talk about things that are going to make things cost more, as opposed to me, I'm talking about things that will make things cost less, like carbon tax. 
So, you know, he's tapping into uh, an existing anxiety and, and anger that's out there around economic management. And he's drawing really clear, short, straight lines between policies and approaches that, that the government's taking and how we do it differently and how that's going to be better for you. That's why he's doing so well. Yeah, without articulating what he would fix about the Bank of Canada or how he would change it. Well, I mean, he's he said he would fire, he, I'd fire the governor, I think, is what yeah. his opening salvo was. That's yeah. pretty well, clear. Welcome I to don't know that that, yeah. yeah, I don't know what that changes about yeah, monetary policy, but okay, yeah. So <laughs> but if you want to take it out of wonk land and put it into clear political bumper sticker communications, that's what you do. Like, I hear that. Thank you know, that. if you yeah. if you look at, you know, say how the Ford government uh used uh you know hydro issues in ontario which were huge uh -huh. issues uh -huh. and converted them into a big political win it was uh fire the ceo of hydro one uh -huh. the six yeah, million no. dollar man that was right uh, where my head went i lived that election Corey. Yeah. yes yeah, <laughs> yeah so, it works reaching back into my time machine thinking about campaigns i've been on uh, where probably even the conservatives are today reminds me a lot of where gordon campbell was in 99 2000 where uh, there was such a, uh, frankly, bloodthirsty appetite for power at that point because of the scars of losing. And there was a, a lot of internal discipline and like, we're not going to screw this up. And the candidates were on, you know, close watch. And, you know, every day, you know, we're killing the uh, the government on some some issue and, question period or in the media or so forth yep. and obviously it led to a, a massive uh, landslide victory it feels to me like that's where the conservatives are today where they're just like have everything so buttoned down and you know obviously there's strong campaign leadership with jenny and you know polyev's on message and you're not hearing any of these dino eruptions uh, these days happening from the backbench and and if they did happen maybe that's <laughs> maybe that would even help but like, what what are your observations of what you see from a campaign perspective? What's happening with the conservatives right now, in terms of the mentality? Well, I think they've mastered new media and the you know the current media yeah. environment much better than the liberals have. And uh, I'm not so worried about candidate and uh, eruptions for the conservatives. Like uh, th that has been something that's tripped up many a conservative party in the past, and I've got I've got the scars to prove it. Yeah. But it was a very, very different media environment uh, that uh, we were dealing with uh, back then. Um, the, you know, I don't think it matters because you know, people aren't going there for, for media coverage. What, what Polio has really mastered is, is putting out your own content and they have the money to, to actually put it in front of people, which increasingly is what you have to yeah. do if you want to reach anyone on social media. The algorithms are such now that uh they demote instead of promote that kind of political content so the, the mm -hmm. only way to really get it to people is to put dollars behind it and uh and they have the dollars and they're and they're mm -hmm. using them so they're creating their own content and they're pushing it out um uh, with money behind it to people who aren't out there looking for it on their own uh, that's how you do well and I think increasingly political parties are immune to negative media uh criticism people who support you and like you don't see it because they're not looking at those outlets and not seeing that in their feed and uh but what they are seeing is stuff they like you know what all these algorithms are really designed to give you more of what you like and less of what you don't like and uh and and that creates all kinds of you know maybe bigger democratic challenges around uh you know uh, polarization and people living in sort of uh, uh, isolated uh, media echo systems uh, where they don't hear dissenting voices, but but that's what it is. And he's you know recognizing the reality of that, and I think campaigning uh, in accordance with it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I agree. I de definitely agree with all that. The proofs in the pudding, and and I heard the other day they raised thirty five million uh, last year, I guess, which is a, a Canadian record for political fundraising. And what I observe that's also different with where the conservatives have gone the last couple of years, last few years, is that they've spent a lot of time really firing up the base, which, you know, conventional wisdom would be you've got to, you know, you've got to have a, a big popular voting base and you got to keep everyone happy and you don't want to offend anybody. But they've really doubled down on the hard base, which has manifested itself in those rallies, but also 
in raising money and getting a really fired up base to do stuff to, to help you. And that, that seems that it's a different approach than say O'Toole was doing or some of the predecessors were able to do. I partially agree with that, Mike. Like I think there, yeah. there are things that you can point to that, that uh, account for that, but I, where I see the most noticeable lift in federal conservative demographics is how they're doing with millennials. Yeah. And, um, and the issue set that is appealing to millennials isn't that they're a bunch of, you know, uh, folks obsessed with pandemic policy or re relitigating that. They're, they're moved by housing and basically a breaking of the, the you know, 50 year, 60 year social contract of, you know, you work hard, you go to school, you get a good job, you're going to be able to have a house, mm -hmm. except you can't now. And, yeah. uh, uh, but you know what they do get is uh, a bill to pay for uh, uh, other people's health care and a bunch of other entitlement programs and things which uh, are questionable whether they'll ever see the benefit of. Uh, so they're kind of getting uh, screwed on both ends right now and and are are increasingly politically active. They're moving into an age now where they're more much more likely to be voters than they have been in previous elections. You know, Trudeau was able to harness millennial voters in 2015 around marijuana legalization, uh, but Polly is, is mobilizing them around housing affordability. Very different mm -hmm. issue set, and it's because they have kids now. And look, I you know, as somebody who lives in a, a little Kleenex box of paradise in uh, in the sky <laughs> in Toronto, uh, you know, my kids are are old enough that we're you know not you know in that stage of my life anymore, but. Uh, can you imagine having one kid and then having a second and you're trying to fit everyone into, you know, uh, 900 square feet of paradise in downtown Toronto? It's not a great, yes, it's not a great yes, uh, thing. Yes, I, you I, can. I, I can. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, I can. Like, <clears throat> so it's understandable that that folks are, are you know, upset about that. And, uh, and you know, only one person is really speaking to those issues in a clear way and in a consistent way. And, and right now that's the federal conservatives. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's interesting. I think and this is it, it's similar to the Bank of Canada problem, because I'd say I'd give Paul Yev a lot of points for articulating the problem and showing that he understands it. And, that you know, there's an egregious case of government titus happening on the on the on the uh, liberal side, right? Where they, it's like, well, we did this and we did this and we did this and it, it doesn't work. That said, um, you know, I, I, I look more to what the, the provincial government has done here in BC in terms of like, as a, as a voter, who's very live to that issue and who has lived a lot of that, who's barely a millennial, but I am one with two kids. Um, you know, I, I, I give more, more kind of in the action box to the EB government than I would to any of the Polyev proposals. I think there's another shoe to drop there for him to show me, to show me what he'd do, how he'd fix it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's no way of fixing this on the demand side, like demand is so off the charts, like there are things that you can do to reduce demand on the margin a bit. And, and I think you're seeing the federal government taking steps around that, like the foreign student visa issue, for instance, mm -hmm. is like, I'd say, you know, probably the, the clearest and easiest lever to pull. Um, but uh, you gotta, you gotta increase supply. And insofar as I think EB and other provincial governments are doing things in that area, it's about taking direct action to increase supply by either overriding municipal governments who are you know, seized and paralyzed by NIMBYism, uh, or whether it's uh, direct intervention in the market by, you know, giving money to people to, to build rental units or, or you know, income targeted uh, uh, housing of one way, shape or form. But, um, but there is a, a more conservative free market approach around that, around interest rates, around uh, decreasing regulation, you know, that, that, you know, exists. I think some of the things that he's talked about, are like tying federal infrastructure money to uh, uh, forcing municipalities to allow densification. So if you want money for your, your transit system from the federal government, and uh, these things are largely a third funded by the federal government, then you're going to have densification on those lines, or you don't get the money, so, which is so, the age old yeah. buy your way into other levels of jurisdiction, which the federal yeah. government's been doing in Canada since the, the Canada Health Act was in, introduced. Uh, Corey, let me ask you about um, candidates and uh, getting ready for the election. 
uh, as you as you know, Alice Ross, our MLA for Skeena, has announced he's going to run federally in the riding of Skeena, Bulkley Valley, and that's a pretty pretty good get for Polyev. How big Huge. a deal? How big a deal is Ellis nationally? Like, how how is that perceived outside of BC? I don't think he's terribly well known nationally in yeah. in the rest of Canada, unless you you know you uh, pay attention quite closely to these things, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, as names go, he's a huge get. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think kind of stylistically, you know, pretty compatible with with Polyev, like, uh, you know, uh, a bit of a truth speaker, a bit of a, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to be, you know, bound by convention or, uh, or any of that, like, so I, I think that's good. But I also think it's very important, because, Increasingly, you can't get any resource development or development of all, all kinds of things that aren't resource development done uh, without some level of consultation with First Nations. That is just a reality. And people can say whether they like that or don't or have various opinions on it. But I think it's just a practical reality that you need that. And, uh, and you need to have uh, you know, people who can, can incredibly help you with, with reconciliation and with, with getting those kinds of agreements and, and bringing that part of the Canadian population along with you. And, uh, uh, it's one of the last frontiers for conservatives is to have, uh, really top drawer first nations folks involved, uh, in, in senior roles in their party. And so insofar as, as he is, uh, uh is filling that role, I think it's incredibly important. Who do you see as as the um, other kind of leading conservatives from BC in uh, the federal caucus? Who who comes to mind? Like oh, you're, from your you're perch, gonna, you're going to get uh, me in trouble uh, yeah. <laughs> if I, I, I answer well, that. But, I, I, but... I'll tell you why I'm asking is because federal politicians don't have a lot of profile here mm -hmm. in BC, and I, I'm asking because I, I, it's not clear to me who who stand who's standing out from the crowd in Ottawa. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the most honest answer that I, you know, I can on that, which is to say that I'm not close enough to uh, the interpersonal relationships with with Polyev and 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 the roster of candidates. Uh, you know, I, but I, I wouldn't limit it like to have that conversation right now. You're really only looking at the incumbent folks. Yeah. And when you look at, at the numbers, he's going to almost triple the number of seats he has in the province. And and probably, you know, uh, the people you're going to be looking to the most are like the example that we just spoken about people that you are recruiting who are high profile mm -hmm. candidates who are very in sync with you and and your agenda and where you want to go. And I, I think it would be, you know, bad advice to any leader to say limit limit your options to the people who are, are incumbents yeah. like, you know, experience matters in this business. And and, you know, I'm a big believer in not promoting rookies into cabinet in most cases. But when you look at other governments that come in, often the people who end up in those senior uh, political roles within a cabinet, uh, they're, they're candidates that the, that the leaders recruited themselves and gotten elected. I'm wondering, a, I'm wondering was, how many MLAs Corey has just nudged across the finish line into the federal conservative <laughs> pool there. That was well, but, but that's a good place to, to, to go. Yeah. Like, look, um, uh, if you're looking for candidates, like they have, they have profile, they know how to run campaigns. Mm -hmm. In the case of, of, uh, you know, if you're taking people from, for instance, uh, BC United, like you might get people who have experience as cabinet ministers, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's a very attractive pool to be fishing in. And if it doesn't look like, uh, a, uh, an election win is imminent in the next BC election, well, it's going to be pretty attractive, uh, to join Team Polyev and and to, to run there and have a shot at cabinet. Artfully done, sir. Artfully done. We have a case now that begins with this division is going to play out for ten years. You're an attractive pool to fish in, and here come be a, come be a federal conservative. Well done. And Corey, it is such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for being our first crossover guest across the pod, <laughs> Air Quads Universe. Air Quads Universe. It's just great to have you on. Thank I don't you. know if Corey is Laverne or Shirley, um, <laughs> but uh, I know many of our uh, listeners may not get that. Right reference but uh <laughs> well uh fraser crane guess, maybe i i feel like i'm the minority partner in in our uh, curse of politics uh broadcast uh but uh 
I'm, I'm, I'm just such a huge fan of, of this medium and this, and what you guys are doing, but also what David's doing with curse and, yeah. uh, and Hurley Burley. I think it's so important. And, and, and I, you know, I see this on every person that you bring on, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a BC liberal or a, a BC NDP person or somebody who's none of the above, the ability to actually have conversations with each other where we can discuss these things and agree is so important in a, what is a highly polarized political environment to remind people that, you know, uh, uh, we can have these conversations and find commonality and uh, uh, be civil to one another. It's, uh, I think it's, it's a good role model. I hope more of the media picks up on it and, and, and tries to do the same. Well said, That's sir. great. Well, thanks for coming yeah. on, Corey. Thank you. My pleasure. Guess. I wonder if you've had this experience where you're hosting visitors from out of province and they remark on the number of EVs on the road. It happens almost every time for me. The stats bear those observations out as BC led Canada in EV uptake in 2022, according to S&P Global Mobility data for new vehicle registrations and the government of BC. I'm proud to live in a province that is leading the country on the uptake of electrical vehicles. And don't pile on me here, Ontario crew. I fully acknowledge that BC's lower mainland has the advantage of a pretty temperate climate, but our leadership on EVs is also powered by one of my favorite things, good public policy. One example that gets plucked out of the Clean BC plan for special credit by market analysts is BC's rebates for charging stations and red tape cutting for strata associations looking to install chargers in multi-home units. Because research shows that concerns around range are a rate-limiting step in EV uptake, and that in order to meet demand, Canada is going to need more than 200,000 chargers to be installed by 2030. That's why, this year, presenting sponsor TELUS is partnering with Jolt to begin installing their comprehensive network of EV fast charging stations across Canada. Jolt is Australia's largest free, fast EV charging network, and already has a broad range of global partnership credentials throughout Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain. And the company is looking to mirror this growth in BC with the help of TELUS. In Canada, Jolt chargers will be powered by TELUS's world-leading networks, and all EV drivers will be able to use their Jolt app to access 7 kilowatt hours of free charging, or up to 50 kilometers of range per day. That's $1,000 worth of charging annually, and is just another way homegrown TELUS is investing in our province. Hello, you've reached the Hotel Pacifico Strategy Suite. Uh, I want to do kind of a a deeper dive on on the Land Act. Uh, So, you know, for context, this is right, the updates to the Land Act uh, that come from from DRIPA. And I I want to start a little bit with how um, how the government consultations on this have gone. And I'll start with you, Jeff, because I'm I'm trying to understand, I know the government had led consultations and had discussions and has done some um, other kind of act revamps out of DRIPA, but this one, which I'm sure the government knew would be hotter than the others, they seem to have kind of fumbled the ball. Do you have any sense of what happened with that? Well, they were really uh, fairly transparent about it. For uh, newcomers to reconciliation politics, DRIPA means the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, which was a fundamental piece of legislation passed unanimously by those who were in the House across all party lines uh, four years ago now. Yes, uh, about 2020. 2019. 2019. It was a very, very big deal. I mean, you were there, Jeff. (laughs) I was there. And procedurally, it was difficult because there was a concern about how individual agreements would roll out. And there was to be a legislative check on that. But ultimately, all of the legislation in the House was to be brought kind of into alignment for reasons uh, with with this act, for reasons that Jeff Plant, former BC Liberal uh, Attorney General, laid out in a column after the storm broke over the Land Act, which is that Canadian law, not Indigenous law, has concluded for a long time now, there's a great deal of uncertainty over every decision on the land in the absence of some kind of framework. And the purpose of this legislation was to create that framework and that Uh, certainty and that acknowledgement of Indigenous rights and title. But the public has a hard time maintaining kind of a focus on that. I want to give a very, very grassroots example of how this has been problematic over years before the legislation and since even, which is uh, docks installed in Pender Harbour, which is a beautiful spot uh, where uh, for many, many years people shared uh, their moorage in a marina. But increasingly, as people buy waterfront property, they are building new docks out uh, across the foreshore for themselves, which in many cases went right across uh, traditional indigenous harvesting grounds, clam grounds, and that kind of thing. 
And so there was a direct conflict between the Seychelles First Nation and the people installing the docks, which became extremely fraught and heated for uh, Nick Simons, the MLA, and for others. So it's precisely to avoid this kind of conflict uh, at, a, at a much more micro level than a mine approval that the Land Act needs to be amended. But uh, I think uh, Nathan Cullen, the minister, has been very uh, candid that he he mismanaged the consultation to the degree that he did it, thinking that this was uh, kind of a, a routine and ho-hum affair since it had been a unanimous vote of the legislature. And all of the same issues that came uh, burbling up during the original debate are back in force. And I think uh, there's a question mark for the government over the wisdom of proceeding with the bill, given the current uh, state of affairs. There was a poll this morning that showed about 20% of the population think that we should have nothing to do with this idea that it's crazy and should be dropped. There's about 20% who are fine with an Indigenous veto over these kinds of decisions and a whole bunch in between who are okay with some version of the of uh, of it that doesn't have either extreme. So, um, you know, it's potentially... Is this the Angus Reid poll you're referring to, uh, Jeff? Pardon Angus Reid poll? Yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think... I think it shows that there could have been support for this approach, but there yes. isn't now. And I'll be looking to the throne speech to see whether the government is intending to pursue this hard into the uh, into the session before the election. Well, this is this is why I wanted to tuck into that a bit because it feels to me, standing outside of it, like the government got into a bit of like rinse repeat process with these with these act reviews, and 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 someone somewhere didn't stop to say, oh wait, the land act's going to be one where we're going to have to we're going to have to approach a little bit more differently and and be a bit more strategic in how we roll it out because i think my my concern is now it's become this kind of i mean some of the language around how people are reacting to to the land act is so incendiary um you know and, and um i want to ask you mike like I, I think we're hearing a lot of people really interrogating the notion of co-decision making right like what does that mean and like is that a veto do, do do indigenous communities now have a uh, uh, veto power over anything we want to do on ninety five percent of the land in BC? Well, they would say no. Um, you, echoing what Jeff said, I mean, there's a lot of jurisprudence behind uh, where crown how crown lands been managed through over the last several decades has been building, building, building in terms of those core cases. And there's no question that right now, any disposition of Crown land requires uh, uh, consultation and uh, interest to be accommodated. So that part's not new, and we knew that's been happening for a long time. I think uh, with with DRIPA and you know the evolution of this to the legislation they're considering uh, this spring, you know, I just there's an information gap. I mean, this is complicated stuff, and you know how this plays out on the street is going to be a surprise to to some people who have interest jeff mentioned docs there'll be other other interests for regular people you know around bc not just the big forest companies the big mining uh -huh. companies uh -huh. so add to that there's two about 200 first nations in bc and the relationship's a little bit different everywhere you go with the surrounding community in some cases very strong and it won't be an issue it's not, i don't believe this is an issue in the Taltan region yeah exactly but in some in some areas uh there will be land use conflicts and there will be that is when the engagement is really important and where i would i'm concerned about with the province is that uh it it, it, it appears that it's the province and the first nations uh, in some cases it pitted against uh community interests mm. whereas I, I believe the province has that responsibility to the first nation to really do the homework with the stakeholders and the interests to bring them along to the table when they're talking to the First Nation. Because uh, the First Nation is expecting a government-to-government -government discussion with the province. And I, my concern is that the First Nation bears the brunt uh, of concern that's in the community because it, you know, it perhaps wasn't managed effectively on the, on the engagement side. Um, so these are tricky things, and you know, the corner of my eye, I'm looking at the Angus Reid survey, and you know, Jeff's right. There's, I think people are pulled in two directions. You know, it's uh -huh. like a lot of issues. People want reconciliation, and people 
agree. I see a majority of them agree that, you know, BC is on unceded territory. And, and there's a lot of, I mean, the public's come a long way on the historical, you know, education side of things over the years. Yeah, yeah. For but sure. at the same time, they get pulled in the other direction about, like, what does this mean for me? Exactly. And is that fair to me? Yeah. And, and that's, therein lies the rub. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I would have said from you can never have enough engagement on it. Exactly. But I think exactly. it's like it's like I could make a decision in my life. I'm going to go hunting uh, on the land, and I'm going to encounter an indigenous interest. And you know that's that's well understood that that could happen right now, but it could happen in other ways. I could talk, or I've decided to put uh, you know a new garage on, and I discover that in fact I have some uh, probable indigenous burial ground behind my place, and and that's going to be a big problem. But these are these are really important issues. You can't turn up turn your back on them. But I think that the uh, the response the opposition has been fascinating because John Rustad just immediately pushed his nuclear button and said, "I'm not just going to not have a land act. I'm not going to have DREPA. I'm going to repeal DREPA." Uh, Kevin uh -huh. Falcon uh, said, "Oh, I'm going to I'm not going to have crown land anymore. I'm going to have something called public land. I'm not sure how that distinction makes a difference." But he's trying to find some way to be against all of this uh, and, yeah. and, and really, really caught in the ringer between Rustad's willingness to just to throw anything overboard. Exactly. Um, uh, and and yet, uh, you know, he's fighting for for the same voters. So it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. But it, the, well, the, right now, the the uh, obligation is on the government yeah. to decide how it wants to play this ball. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll, Go ahead. I'll note Thank that you. Falk in Falcon's case. Um, that he had Ellis backing him on that position, Ellis Ross. So um, there are nuances uh, between the parties. I, I think I agree with you, generally speaking. I think yeah. the BC Conservatives and the BC United are kind of tracking the same direction. It, it's worth mentioning, and Kate, I might be stealing your thunder on this, that there, awesome. there have been some interesting pieces written about this in the last couple of weeks. Uh, former Attorney General Jeff Plant put out a perspective, basically supporting the government's perspective on it. On the other hand, a former deputy minister, um, Robin Younger, from Macmillan Law Firm, has written something very uh, critical. So there's there's uh, lots of opinions, lots of different takes on it, and that will obviously add to the debate on it. Uh, but bringing it back to the question, um, where does this, where does the government stand politically on this right now? And I think uh, kind of low bridging it out the as it. I think I used one of my shots recently on this. Low bridging mm -hmm. it out of the gate um, was a mistake. And um, it's time to kind of soup up the, the engagement process. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, they, I, I would have said from this, you know, standing back and looking at this from the beginning, your problem is a lack of clarity. Your problem is people reacting to not understanding what this is and what this means. And so as a first step out of the gate to sort of have people feel like this was, you know, slipped underneath the door somehow is just not, not helpful. So I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to this one. I do want to take a little bit of time to talk about nominations and acclamations, uh, because we do kind of see a good steady ticker, uh, of, uh, of names popping out. And I, I want to start with you, Mike, because I think we are seeing, Again, some some differentiation in the approach we're seeing from BC United and from the Conservatives. With, um, you know, BC United seems to be really driving for some good star candidates, um, mostly by acclamation. And then we're seeing um, the Conservatives more with folks with kind of no political experience, more rookies and kind of fresh faces on the scene. Um, what do you, what do you think is what do you think is behind these two different strategies? Well, I think. It's not necessarily a difference in strategies. If the Conservatives could get better candidates, they would. Um, BC United's... Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> well, wouldn't you take a better candidate than the worst candidate? I mean, I th they're, they're throwing these people are, the These are right selfless now. members of the BC public. Uh, staff I am sure so. they'll be... <laughs> this is a selfless I, act to run. When I was uh, literally throwing bodies onto the ballot in 1991 election, uh, I believe I was referring to them as working class heroes. <laughs> but uh, in absence of any uh, curriculum vitae that uh, was available. Uh, but these days, I mean, BC United is having some success at pulling some good candidates together. And they've um, they caught, caught my attention the past week in terms of two doctors that jumped on the ballot, one in Surrey mm -hmm. and one in Kelowna, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are doctors who are talking about all the issues with health care, and they'll, they'll bring some credibility to that debate. 
Uh, Caroline Elliott, who was nominated in West Vancouver Campolano, is uh, well known within the party. She worked in the legislature about 20 years ago or, or less and is a PhD candidate and vice president of the party, smart policy mind, media commentator. She brings a lot of tools and she's, you know, young. And that is what they need. They need more young people in BC United. So um, regardless of the outcome of Define the election. young, Mike. <laughs> younger than me and younger than you. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, pretty okay. easy. Yeah, pretty easy uh, in Kate, my case. Well, Kate's, Kareem, uh, Kareem tells me the average age is 44. So that's, uh, you might yeah. be aiming too high. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the elections are an important point for any party in terms of renewing, right? And constant renewal. And this election, more than any for BC United, my God, they need to renew. Yes. And yes. I noticed a Vancouver Sun piece this week and I, um, talking about, the, you know, some new candidates for BC United, but, uh, you know, some of the ones that are retiring, it's like a punch in the face to Kevin Falcon. It's like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> like, yeah. I, I love them all dearly. I, I helped get them elected a couple elections ago, but they have to create that space for new people to come in and they are, and that should be applauded. So, um, you know, I, I bring on the change for BC United and it seems that they're getting some quality candidates there. Now this is harkening back to our conversation with Corey about the stalemate that exists between BC conservatives and BC United. There certainly is a problem in the polls for BC United. Absolutely. And it's a conservative brand issue versus an unknown brand. And part of that is also the positions they take to Corey's point. Uh -huh. But at least on the candidate front and in terms of money and other organizational things, BC United does have that going for them. And will the public start seeing that and recognizing it? Uh -huh. I'm not so sure they'll see it anytime soon, but at election time they might, but it might be too late by then. So, Well, um, the, it, there's, a, there's another version of that too. It's interesting because I, I found that commentary from Corey really interesting too in his assessment. Like I'd call them neck and neck at this stage, right? Like one party with the polls yeah. behind them and one party with the machinery behind them. But I them and I, I think the thing is then you know you draw from that this election is going to be a make or break and if the conservatives are sort of pulling a lot of newbies and folks with extreme positions I I wonder whether some of what could turn the clock is the, the stuff that happens when the writ drops and people's Twitter accounts get you know scrutinized yeah, by war rooms I, and it's not enough time I, I don't I don't think uh, it'll get sorted out in the writ period especially with early voting now. Uh, the the elections are over before they bear they, before they've started. Certainly, the last one was with all the mail in ballots, but wow. even still, like it's people aren't sitting back and waiting a month before they make their mind up. Like people oh, are Russia, eager to vote in advance. But they, so. but they, Russia, but they go ahead. yeah. Well, Russia doesn't have the time to wait around for nomination meetings. He's doing the right thing by appointing people, and it mm -hmm. gives him more control over who they are. Hopefully, he's vetting them a little bit. So he's preempting a lot of political space there, meaning that uh -huh. I agree with Mike. There's not going to be there's not going to be a deal, but whether whether Rusty can actually get organized and run a good campaign with very Jeff Meg says there's not going to be a deal. Jeff no, Meg just said it. Over. <laughs> Decision. Second, I mean, we should get some music uh, on this. I just <laughs> heard, uh, Jeff Meg. Da, 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 decision desk. Jeff Meg. <laughs> I just heard Corey tonight. Prove I him wrong, him. BC United, BC Conservatives. Prove no, him wrong. No deal. Let him speak. No Not deal. Not happening. Let him speak. Jeff doesn't want a deal. Interesting. Okay, Jeff. Jeff. Okay, back so to you. Can yeah, Russ get organized? Can he run a credible <laughs> campaign? That's yes. 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 He can okay. run. He can run a guerrilla campaign. Uh, from the hills, they'll run into the the cities at night and uh, break some windows and run back <laughs> into the hills, and they'll get some they'll get some writings that way. It's sort of but, a Maoist strategy. But to my point about my conversation, the conversation we had with Corey earlier, which is like you got to run to win, you know. So, so I think the conservatives out there are thinking of uh, voting for BC Conservative. Fair enough, but you're right. But I would say. You should be evaluating these guys on whether they can actually go the distance. Because if uh -huh. they, if they're not prepared to go the distance, if they're not planning to go the distance, then it's a big waste of time, and you've just elected the NDP for another four years. Yeah. But um, if you seriously want to form government, then both parties have to show a pathway to their supporters how they're going to do it. Because not neither are right now, in my opinion. Yeah, you're right. It's an expensive hobby. You want to win. Let's raise a glass or take a shot. Time to raid the mini bar. 
I haven't mentioned the Green Party today yet, but I'm going to now because I think it's time to raise a glass to Adam Olson, who um, continues to be out there on various issues, including the Land Act and and other things, providing very steady, uh, constant, uh, I would say, criticism uh, and analysis uh, consistently. I think he's turning into one of those MLAs who will be there as long as he wants and is widely respected uh, around the legislature and by the press gallery. The Green Party uh, owes, should put a statue up to him somewhere. He's been their interim leader or leader on a couple of occasions. And if Sonia First now can't beat Grace Laura, and I suspect she will not, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll see, then he may be the leader again. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's an, he's an interesting phenomenon in BC politics, and I raise a glass to him because I think he's a very decent person. Hmm. Mike? Uh, I'm going to take a shot at multiple shots <laughs> ooh, ooh. uh i can take a shot at political parties i think this applies to frankly all of them um with some differences in this provincial election cycle where uh there is a complete absence of grassroots democracy um and that, and i will admit right now that i'm been one of the i've been a, a high-risk offender of uh of being the bad guy at central office who uh, sometimes you have, you have to break some eggs to get the candidates you want in order to ensure uh, diversity and ensure um, women getting nominated or even just good old winnable candidate. But right now there's virtually no nomination meetings in this cycle. Hmm. And, and I think that's a problem and uh, it, it's done now for this cycle. And some very good candidates have been appointed which is which is great but it's kind of an ends justify the means thing and i'm a bit more of an idealist on this in in theory than in practice frankly if i'm going to be self-critical <laughs> myself but it's still thank you for your honesty it, it's still it, it is important you know because why uh -huh. would anyone belong to a political party uh -huh. if you don't get any say uh at the end of the day now you can go to a, a convention and and vote for policy resolutions that will go nowhere uh, at least can, you can be part of something but I think in a perfect world, after this election's over, each party's got to take a look in the mirror. And, and this is really up to the grassroots members who need to kind of demand better out of the leadership of the party to say, what are what's a reasonable way to elect our candidates where actually, if I'm like a city councillor in some place or a, just an average member and I, I aspire to be an MLA, I actually... Can go sign up my friends and have a chance of that, and I think that's 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 reasonable. Well, uh, right like now, it, it's 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 basically put your hand up first, and if you pass the test, you're in. You know, and I, well, that's not fair in NDP circles, Mike. I mean, David Eby can't really appoint anybody, unless except in, there might be a super okay. exception circumstance. Fair enough. But, but I haven't uh, seen a lot of. I know there's a Donnybrook shaping up in Power River Sunshine Coast, but yeah, five I haven't seen a lot of NDP nomination meetings. Well, I think there's more to come. But we'll see okay. because there's a high number of incumbents, and uh, and my understanding is there will be some nominations as much as Sunshine Coast. There wasn't one in Vancouver, Mount Pleasant, and that was a safe seat. That could have been a hotly contested nomination meeting for the NDP. No, and, that was yeah, that was carefully thought through. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think there's degrees of difference between the parties, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think they could all do better. I like world. that. Uh, I like that no. a lot. I wish I no. wish we did. I'm yeah. not the guy at the put, Central put, put Party office. Yeah. 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 Do as I say, not as I but do. I, I think it, it bears it. more scrutiny in the future, is what I'm saying. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I hope we come back to it. That would have been a good one to end on. But I'll I'll wrap with um I want to raise a glass this week and I want to raise a glass for to uh uh Raisa Patel at the Toronto Star, um, who did a really solid fact check on Pierre Polyev and a stat he's been quoting pretty regularly about that's a Vancouver stat on um, uh, 40 offenders who were repeatedly arrested. Um, 6,000 uh, times. 6,000 times. And the way he quotes it, it's, you know, over the course of a year and it's violent offenders. And so, you know, what, you, what it literally paints is a picture of these 40 people who are out you know, hurting other people and then you know, for, and then going into jail the next day and then getting out and rebanding out. And, um, uh, right. So does a really good takedown of kind of like, actually, uh, this wasn't, these aren't violent offenders. It is more, um, sort of, uh, vandalism and it's property, uh, property crimes. 
um, you know, it's not actually arrests, it's just negative contacts with police. It's actually not over the course of a year. Like it's just not, it, it just doesn't hold water at the end of it. Um, and I'm grateful that, you know, these sorts of fact checks are happening because I think the kind of community safety issue is huge and is live and is real. Um, and I think we have to be very careful, particularly in conversations where we're othering people, that we are working in reality and truth and not in some fiction of uh, of what um, what people who are also part of our community are actually up to and what they look like. So um, cheers to Raisa Patel. Sure. All right. That Toronto, is... Star, uh, Toronto Star, that's a community newspaper in Toronto. <laughs> it, well, just a shout out to, I have to say, Toronto okay. Star, I come from an era in journalism when Daniel Dale got that, the art of the fact check, I think, really nailed down when he was covering um, uh, Rob Ford as mayor of Toronto and then took that to the White House and actually gave us the, the Trump lie detector when he was out in uh, D.C. He's now at CNN. But, you know, shout out to Toronto Star. They do some good, good fact checks. They're they're. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Very parochial. <laughs> Sorry. I enjoyed it. Um, and I enjoyed today's episode. Thank you so much to our guest, Corey, tonight. It was fabulous having a, uh, an air quotes crossover. Um, and thank you to our presenting sponsor, Talis. Uh, we'll see you next week, guests. BC, you can never leave. Check out time at Hotel Pacifico. We hope you enjoyed your stay.